the Plectonaths. These were some of the naivetes of the young Americans. In some, a view of our society, which in the most natural way of coming about was an affirmation of life, freedom, and growth, and which was profoundly humanistic, the original convictions of our founding fathers. The decade of the 1960s, up until the 1968 Chicago Convention, was the momentous time when the possibility of America underwent a surge of growth, a re-emergence through action, literature, and especially the new music, of primal American aspirations. And these young Americans were the new Americans who, in a manner that seemed obvious to them, saw that the vision of an America, a place where human life could truly be free in growth, happy in fulfillment, and at ease in society, that this America, always dreamed of and yearned for by mankind, was practically realizable as of now. That now, at this moment of our authentic achievement of a technological society, the immediate actualization of America was possible. The possibility of America was the intention and aspiration of the new Americans. This was not, however, the intention of the dis-Americans, and for their part they served notice in 1968 that the Counter-Reformation had begun. As the possibility of America grew during the 1960s, swelling legions of identifiable young Americans also grew, identifiable as to behavior, appearance, language, and taste. These were not the quiet and sullen rebels without a cause of the beat, alienated and impotent youth of the 1950s. The new Americans were alert, optimistic, confident, inordinately sophisticated in their knowledge of the world. Most frightening of all, they acted upon their beliefs. The new Americans were a unique event in American history. They were the progeny of a successfully established technological society, healthy, intelligent humans who had been reared with the security, the vitamins, the orange juice and hamburgers and television and the expansive affluence and freedom of movement that became characteristic of the massive American middle class following World War II. The World War had brought victory, and it had brought enormous advances in technology which made communication transportation and efficiency in industrial and bureaucratic processes the most effective in human history. The triumphant USA consolidated its victory by becoming the world's first technological society, a society in which the ancient human scarcities of production no longer existed. Such a society became a place, consequently, where the ancient human insecurities about survival had theoretically ceased to predominate. But the technological organization of this society developed simultaneously, along with a human economic organization which remorselessly widened the social gap between rich humans and poor humans, first with the racial minorities, then with the workers, and then with the near-famine conditions of 1975 in which a nation of unparalleled resources had millions of responsible citizens who literally could not afford to live. The young couples who became parents during and after the Second World War had, of course, been inculated with the philosophy and depression actuality of having to survive in an insecure world. To most of them, the notion of fighting to survive was most real. But by the end of the war, with the extraordinary expansion of American productivity and affluence, they had evolved beyond the situation of fighting to survive. Yet it must be remembered that this post-war parental generation who slipped into the enjoyments of ease and affluence were not born and bred to that affluence. Their childhood experiences, particularly those of the Great Depression of the 1930s, were those of fear, alertness, seriousness, and the overriding affirmation of work and duty as the center of human existence. 
and so a curious and fearful generation of parents established themselves as the middle Americans of the 1960s and 70s. They were a generation who, in childhood, had been steeled for a long, hard struggle through life, but who, in adulthood, found themselves in a situation of relative ease and security. They settled into the kind of numbed enjoyment and moral hebetude that could be comfortably insensitive to either racial injustice or a Vietnam bloodbath. That was the inner conflict. Psychologically, culturally, and cognitively, they were trained for one kind of world, only to discover that they now had to live in quite a different kind of world. Their feelings and convictions and abilities were neither made for nor adapted to a technological society. Theirs was an education to struggle toward a technologized and controlled environment, not to enjoy it, administrate it, and appreciate its categorically new possibilities as an accomplished fact. It remained for their children to see these new possibilities because this next generation was the first generation ever to be born and nurtured within an established technological society, the naive New Americans. And it is this internal conflict, utterly understandable and historically inescapable in its happening, which made this most powerful and affluent older generation so curiously insecure. And their controlling hands was something unique in human history. A massive supply of extra energy, above and beyond their survival needs of the entire population, all of this surplus power was in their hands, and theirs were hands untrained and incapable of handling this power for what it was. The power to make possible a national life which, at long last, did not reflect a constant attitude of lifestyle of fighting to survive. This was power which, on top of actually guaranteeing survival, could now be used to guarantee the chance to all women and men of a life that was fully and expansively human. The full possibility of an actualized America was literally in the hands of the silent majority. But theirs were hands trained for struggle and combat. Such is the pathos of this fearful generation, a generation of citizens who had the possibility of America in their hands but could not quite handle this new possibility which they themselves had struggled so hard to achieve. Trained for combat, they used this surplus power for combat. Trained to see danger, they used this technology to discover dangers. Trained to fear, they found fear all around them, both outside of their borders and within. In the fish kingdom there has evolved a strange order of creatures called the plectognaths, a name which means twisted jaw. They are a curious lot, such as the porcupine fishes, the box fishes, and the trigger fishes. These animals, which are considered by biologists to be at the terminus of their evolutionary line, are characterized by having small, tight mouths and armored, tough skin and bear within them poisonous chemicals which not only endanger other fish, but at times are a danger to themselves. The somber, threatening, and tight-jawed generation which came to power after the 1940s was like these plectonaths, strange, surprising fish that were tightly overprotective and were at the dead end of their evolutionary line. What a curiously fearful generation indeed, having overcome the basic foundations of environmental fear and insecurity, the plectognaths inexplicably found themselves surrounded by even greater fears and insecurities. People, nations, situations, ideas which on the surface might look unthreatening and normal, but if looked at intently with the lucid vision of fear and insecurity, the plectognaths could see dark, sinister, conspiratorial, secret, and hidden dangers looming up and almost ready to attack. 
I am suggesting that this plectognathic generation is curious in its social pathology. Because of the inescapable conflict between their childhood realities and their adult realities, this generation was paranoid. It displayed a consistent attitude that was, without appropriate cause, fearful, suspicious, and delusionary. The plectognathic generation saw things to fear where others did not. And it is this paranoid vision of contemporary reality that was not only the foundation of the generation gap, but was the driving power behind the psychotic conviction of the plectonaths that the possibility of America must be repressed in order for the United States to survive. This is social insanity, hallucinatory and self-destructive. And it is representatives of this pathological attitude, the dominant majority of white middle-class Americans of the 1960s, who served notice in 1968 that the possibility of America, envisioned by the new American generation, was a national danger. In 1968, peace officially became the greatest single danger to the survival of the United States of America. What is so extraordinary is that such insanity could be maintained and justified before the world, as if it were only one more slice of the familiar American apple pie. And the fact that such insanity was accepted and acted upon was made possible simply because those who held this attitude also held the greatest surplus of power ever placed in the hands of a nation's dominant class. They had the might, and this guaranteed that they were right. But the rightness of this dangerous and self-destructive vision of reality was also acceptable, because it had come on so slowly and imperceptibly that the dis-American vision never quite transgressed the threshold of consciousness of the majority of the population. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki did not do it, nor did the dis-American activities of the McCarthy Committee drive the point home. Over the period of the 40s and 50s and 60s, this perverted American attitude gradually gained acceptance as right. And this is precisely how tyranny germinates, grows, and takes over a democratic republic. The originating right attitudes of the democratic republic gradually become wrong, and the obvious wrongs gradually become right. As Tom Paine expressed it, a long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it the superficial appearance of being right, and raises at first a formidable outcry in defense of custom, but the tumult soon subsides. Time makes more converts than reason. Paine said this as a preface to his attempt to awaken the inhabitants of America to the abuses of the English crown to whose tyrannies they had gradually become habituated. And it is this gradual, unalarming habituation, never fully breaking into the experienced normality of consciousness, that is the gentle declining road of decadence leading softly toward national degeneration. With the same elan as Tom Paine, the new Americans were attempting to wake up the plectognathic generation from a consciousness of the wrongness of their aberration from the American intention. With an optimism as strong as their naivete, they magically discovered through their technologically close and interwoven society that they were a positive nationwide community which rested upon the mandate given them by the spirit of 1776. This nationwide new American community was cohesive, aware, organized, and suddenly powerful, all because the technological closeness of our society makes such positive nationwide communities possible. They press their issue of peace, organized national sentiment for it, raised up a presidential candidate in Eugene McCarthy, and then, powerful in their consciousness of being a national American community, they took their issue and their candidate to Chicago during the late summer of 1968. 
With the Republican Party already seen committed to dis-America, they concentrated on the National Democratic Convention as the place where sanity and democratic process might turn the tide of the United States. They were not simply ignored, as if they were politically insignificant, but they were deliberately, physically attacked, and remorselessly clubbed down as if they were politically seditious and dangerous. Chicago in 1968 was the first national confrontation of the naive New Americans with the Plectognaths, and the Plectognaths characteristically saw the New Americans as fearsome and in need of vigorous repression. It was not only the Democratic Party which forced this aggression. It was also the police, and also the city of Chicago, and also the nation. The plectonathic generation lined up their ranks and supported and approved the clubbing down of these loud, boorish, and uninitiated youth. This Americans of both parties closed ranks and grimly affirmed their common intention to have no more of the young Americans and their cause. Two events of permanent historical importance occurred in August 1968, the end of a viable two-party system and the beginning of tyranny. The ruling majority of the nation, the plectonathic generation, rose above the petty dualisms of political party and came together as of one mind and intention. Their intention was clear. They intended to prevent America from continuing to happen. <laughs> 